Hello, Camille here at the mic on Radio BBM. And joining me now is a very special guest. He designed radio systems for the South African government, as well as among top engineers and scientists at the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva. So from the biggest of projects to work closer to home, Adam Farson is an expert in all things radio. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Adam. Oh, it's my pleasure, Camille. Well, I was reading a bit about you and you have quite the resume, but I was wondering how you got your start in radio. What drew you to, to radio in the first place? Well, when I think back to my <clears throat> childhood in the UK, one of the first places I was taken to which really got my interest going was the Science Museum in South Kensington in London. They had a very comprehensive display for the time of uh, electricity and radio, and I found that this got my attention more than a lot of the other exhibits. And uh, during the war, the BBC played a major role, of course, not only in, in keeping the British people informed, but also in providing clandestine communications to Allied agents uh, operating in occupied Europe, although I wasn't to know all these details until later on. My parents were very supportive and very encouraging when I saw, they saw that I had this tremendous, well, they, they said all-consuming interest in electricity and radio. They started buying me books on related subjects. Uh, I recall that there was a book I had called The Wonder Book of Electricity, which con contained chapters detailing how such things as a radio, uh, receiver, radio transmitters, uh, television, uh, the London Underground system, air conditioning and various other, <coughs> excuse me, electrical, electromechanical and electronic devices worked, although the word electronics wasn't widely used until close to the end of World War II. Yeah, so uh, as a youth, what a time to, to be interested in uh, radio and electricity in, in England. It was quite, quite a, a major major point uh, in those well, days? Well, uh, the, it can truthfully, truthfully be said that the Second World War was the first of the electronic wars. Without electronics, uh, the war would have probably have taken a lot longer, a whole lot more people would have been killed, and it would just have been a whole lot messier. Some of the greatest discoveries and inventions in radio, electronics, and related fields were made during World War II. Uh, one only needs to think of radar uh, for example, and then microwave, uh, the requirement for a radar system giving <clears throat> a very detailed view of the target led to microwave research, which in turn led to the invention of a device called the cavity magnetron, which was a valve or tube capable of developing very high power in the microwave region. This led to radars which were small enough to be carried aboard a bomber aircraft and which would actually display a map of the target area on a screen in front of the bomb aimer or navigator. Wow, my goodness. The advances in technology like that, um, quite, quite incredible, even, even now thinking back to what Yes, and, uh, and this created. is true. This is true of all sides. Uh, the, the, the Germans had some first-class radio engineers. In fact, for a while it looked as if they were ahead of the Allies, although in the field of radar, they got off to a better start than the British in some ways. They had some radar systems that were smaller and had greater range and were more mobile or portable than the British systems, which were all fixed at the time. But because of the fundamental differences in the political systems of the two countries, the British didn't have the political impediments to research and development that Germany did, and they were able to move ahead faster, and they, to, with the result that the Axis side never really caught up. <clears throat> but uh, going over what uh, German radio and electronics engineers did during World War II, they laid much of the foundation for systems and equipment that we have today. Well, one has to give them credit for that. Absolutely, yes. and. For you, as a radio engineer, um, how did you start? It sounded like you started at quite a young age, really studying um, radio and electricity and, and how it worked. Um, but what was your first professional experience in ra the radio field? 
Well, I would say my first professional experience was <clears throat> during my time at university. Uh, we had an excellent lecturer in electrical communications, as it was called. This was at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, he covered all aspects of wire and radio communications, the telephone, the telegraph, telex, the development of the teleprinter, and then radio, radar, and television. And this gave me, for the first time, a theoretical depth to go together with my interest and practical knowledge. Whilst I was at university, I was finally able to find the time to study for an amateur radio license, which I got in 1962, when I was in my third or junior year at university, and I've been a fairly active radio amateur ever since. Yes, and with your, your amateur radio experience, um, what, what has that involved over the years? Well, you first of all have to obtain a license from the uh, telecommunications or radio regulatory body in Canada. That would be Industry Canada. In South Africa, it was the post office radio branch. To get the license, you had to demonstrate technical knowledge and knowledge of radio regulations, which are quite detailed and govern all aspects of the use of a transmitter on the air. Then you also have to, had to, at the time, pass a Morse code exam, which meant that you had to demonstrate your ability to send and receive Morse code at a particular speed. Well, I learned Morse code in Cape Town, which fortunately was a harbor city that had ample facilities for teaching Morse code to maritime radio officers. I went to one of the schools that uh, conducted courses for would-be maritime radio telegraph operators. That's how I learned the code and was able to pass the exam. My goodness, from Morse code to, to newer technologies, it's quite well, a field. Morse code is still popular, even though in 2005, Industry Canada abolished the requirement for Morse code pursuant to a change in international radio regulations, um, abolishing the mandatory requirement for Morse code as a precondition of an amateur radio license. The international governing body, which governs all aspects of wire and radio communications, is the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, which is an agency of the United Nations. And every United Nations member country has a regulatory body which is uh, a member of the ITU. So when the ITU makes a regulation, all UN member countries are bound by it. And when the ITU decided that Morse code should no longer be a mandatory requirement, almost every country in the world dropped the requirement. They, the way they worded the change was that it was up to the individual country. If the country decided to go along, that was fine. If they decided to retain Morse code, that would also be acceptable. But the vast majority of countries, including Canada, scrapped the code. However, notwithstanding this, there still is a lively interest in Morse code because more, uh, transmission of Morse code involves turning the transmitter on and off. It's turned on for a, a dot or a dash. The Morse code is made up of dots and dashes. The Morse code or continuous wave signal known as CW among radio people occupies a very small bandwidth, which means that not much power is required to transmit Morse code. Very typically, a portable radio set used by the army in World War II had a power output of one or two watts. Now, to put this into perspective, a handheld radio, walkie-talkie radio used by a police officer has an output of five watts. A typical amateur radio, HF, high frequency or shortwave amateur radio station, has a power output of anything from 100 watts to one or two kilowatts. Mm. So certainly a value in Morse code to be able to um, operate on a much smaller... With lower powered portable equipment, certainly, mm -hmm. because you can actually buy or build a radio set which will operate off batteries and take it anywhere. So that's the big merit of Morse code. It allows, <coughs> pardon me, communication over vast distances with low power. Right. That certainly has that going for it, yes.
And now you mentioned that you went to school in Cape Town. And I was reading how you worked for the Ministry of Defense in South Africa. So what kind of radio systems were you involved in creating down there? Well, I didn't work directly for the Ministry of Defense. I worked for a well-known British company, Raycal, which uh, has now been absorbed into a larger French company. But I worked for Raycal. It was my first job. And they were a contractor to the Ministry of Defense. We were developing a portable VHF radio system for the South African Army, and also HF, or shortwave radio systems, which were intended to be used by the South African Army, the Portuguese Army, and civilian users, such as, for example, the National Parks Board and uh, oil exploration companies and the shipping industry. So I was involved with the development of uh, subsystems or parts of uh, several of these radios. And it was very interesting work and it gave me a, a background which has pretty well stayed with me to the present day. Right, absolutely, and it sounds like quite a, a number of applications there for, for those types of radio systems. Yes, yes, we, we were able to, in fact, we developed um, what is known as a man pack radio. It's a transmitter receiver in a package that can be carried on a soldier's back. Typically it weighs between seven and 12 kilo, has a built-in battery pack. You've probably seen pictures of soldiers with these radios on their backs. Unfortunately, the radio tells the bad guys that this is the primary target and you want to pop him before you pop anybody else. That's the only disadvantage oh, of, a of a man pack radio. But uh, we, we were developing a a shortwave or high-frequency man-pack radio which used a new transmission system, well, relatively new, called single sideband, uh, replacing the traditional AM or amplitude modulation. This made it possible to build a transmitter with much greater range using much less power and therefore able to operate for a longer period of time on lightweight batteries. But well, we built a, a man-pack set where in a field trial with two of the sets, we were able to get a range of 600 kilometers between two operators simply standing with the radios on their backs. And that's a tremendous range for that type of radio. Absolutely. Gosh, and, and so you mentioned uh, using AM. Well, I've heard uh, quite a bit about AM and FM. And really, for the listeners out there in the village who uh, may not know very much about radio, what's, what's the difference between those? Okay, well, I'll try to explain it briefly. AM means amplitude modulation. The word modulation means either mixing, mixing two signals in the very general sense or in the sense of transmission of intelligence by radio. Modulation means impressing the intelligence or program material which it is desired to transmit onto a carrier, the carrier wave or carrier is a radio frequency signal. In the case of, uh, say, a medium wave AM broadcast, the frequency of the carrier might be 690 kilohertz, as, for example, in CBC Radio 1. Now, the way amplitude modulation works is, is it, it varies the amplitude or the, if you like, the, if you look at the wave, if you look at the display of the wave on a screen of an instrument called an oscilloscope, you will see that the amplitude or the height of the wave is constant if there's no modulation applied to it. If you apply amplitude modulation, you'll see that on the peaks of uh, voice or music, the wave height increases in accordance with the level or the volume of the sound the, of, or the, of the program material impressed on the carrier. So you're varying the amplitude or the amount of power in the, in the signal. Unfortunately, amplitude modulation is subject to interference because interference such as the re repetitive clicks or pops generated by spark plugs in a car engine or by the igniter in an oil furnace is also amplitude modulated. This is an, a radio frequency signal of varying amplitude or varying power which will be picked up by the receiver in exactly the same way as the desired signal. I know exactly what you mean. I was in the car the other day listening to 690 CBC, and we were traveling underneath the trolley wires for the buses, and it was 
just uh, completely distorting the, the sound. That's Is right. Is that what you, you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm referring yes. to. The, the trolley buses have electronic equipment in them which chops up the power. And this chopping generates radio frequency signals which drop right on top of the CBC signal. Now, FM frequency modulation eliminates this because instead of varying the instantaneous amplitude or height or power level of the carrier, the carrier level is constant. The frequency or the wavelength, frequency is actually inverse of wavelength. Uh, there's a very simple formula which relates frequency and wavelength. Uh, 300 divided by the wavelength in meters is equal to the frequency, uh, to put it very simply. And the uh, frequency is varied. The instantaneous frequency, the frequency at any one instant in time, is varied in accordance with the modulating signal, or in other words, the program. So if you have music on an FM signal, the louder the music the bigger the frequency, the bigger the instantaneous frequency change. The higher the pitch of the music, the more f often this change occurs. You can't easily see the uh, effect of frequency modulation on an oscilloscope, but another instrument called a spectrum analyzer, which does exactly that, it analyzes the spectrum of the signal and shows its individual components on a screen, will give you a very vivid representation of what an FM signal looks like. FM has the huge advantage that it's not subject to amplitude-modulated noise because the receiver limits the power or the amplitude of the incoming signal so that no matter how the signal strength varies, the volume at the output of the receiver is not going to vary. The only thing that will vary the volume at this loudspeaker is the width of the instantaneous frequency change known as the, known as the deviation. So FM was originally developed by Edwin Armstrong in the early 30s as a means of combating the interference which plagued the AM broadcasters. And it proved to be astoundingly successful. In fact, he put together an FM broadcast network in the northeastern United States known as the Yankee Network, which uh, started to give the uh, big broadcasters a pain. So the FCC, uh, under pressure from the broadcasters, effectively shut him down, unfortunately. Uh, but FM was used in military radio communications, mainly by the U.S. Army, but later by the British, and ultimately by NATO, again for the same reason of interference suppression, uh, with a tremendous success. The advantage of FM in a military radio setting is here you're in a tank. The tank has a petrol gasoline engine with spark plugs and generators and gun mechanisms and all sorts of things that generate interference. If your radio system is FM, it will not suffer from any of that. Whereas uh, the old World War II AM tank radios, if you were on the edge of the range of the transmitter, all you'd hear would be your own engine noise. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, FM, quite quite the improvement then as well, especially in military settings. Military when you're really relying on... Radio. Military, broadcasting, another application was commercial two-way radio. The Germans and Dutch prior to World War II had uh, commercial two-way radio systems used by the police and by commercial companies, which again was, were astoundingly successful and led to the use of VHF by the German army. Now, the Germans didn't use FM much for some reason, which I've never really fully figured out, but... Uh, there the seems to be politics that often play into, like you mentioned, the Yankee network, that there's pressures sometimes. Uh, well, there were two. The Yankee network created problems for two sets of people. First of all, uh, the AM broadcasters, when they had uh, network hookups, for example, something like a coast to coast network, they leased expensive program lines from the telephone companies. And. Uh, with, that, with the FM, it's possible to link FM transmitters together by having each transmitting site receive the signal of the previous site using the, uh, the, site, the transmitter site as a kind of repeater or relay. And you can have several of these in cascade without degrading the signal too badly. But then the beauty of it all is you don't need phone lines, expensive phone lines. So there were two lots of people that were hurting over FM. One was the big incumbent AM broadcasters because suddenly FM could broadcast music with another thing uh, it allows for a wider bandwidth, which means that FM can broadcast hi-fi music, which AM can't. This comes into the whole question of bandwidth, which I'll go into. But there was firstly that. AM, by comparison with FM for music listening, was could be quite unpleasant at times. And then 
the telephone company was crying crocodile tears because they were losing all their revenue. <laughs> so That's they right. went to the FCC and they put on the Crybaby Act with the result that uh, uh, Armstrong, Armstrong lost his FM licenses. But FM was re-established after World War II on a different band. Mm -hmm. uh, the band formerly used by FM was assigned to television, so at least it was put to good use. At least... At least it was, yes. Now, just a couple of brief words about bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, an AM signal, uh, if I could just give a few numbers. Sure. An AM signal on 690 kilohertz, uh, CBC Radio 2. If the maximum bandwidth of the transmitted audio programming is, for example, 10 kilohertz, then the radio signal will occupy a bandwidth of twice that, 20 kilohertz. So the receiver must be designed to pass a band of 20 kilohertz, and the receiver contains filters, which provide what is known as selectivity, in other words, the ability of the receiver to receive only the desired signal and reject all adjacent signals. So it'll hear 690, but it won't hear 730, for example. Now with FM, because of the mathematical nature of FM, the bandwidth required is very much greater. However, it doesn't have the restrictions that AM does because FM operates in the VHF band, very high frequency, 88 to 108 megahertz, where there's a whole lot more real estate, so to speak, to spread oneself out. So a typical FM signal uh, occupies, one signal occupies 180 kilohertz, which is, roughly speaking, nine times that of an AM signal. But because of this, instead of the audio bandwidth being restricted to... 10 kilohertz at the most, it can go all the way out to 15 kilohertz, which means if you want to broadcast hi-fi music, as in CBC Radio 2 or BBC Radio 4, you can do it and it'll sound decent. It'll, it'll be acceptable to the hi-fi listener who's accustomed to the sort of sound he'll get out of a CD. So that's another one of the great beauties of FM. In Europe, all the, mu the uh, classical and jazz music broadcasting services use FM. That's when they're not doing digital broadcasting, which is another set of issues altogether. Right, some, some new, newer technologies coming along as well. Right, but right. Interesting, you mentioned uh, Europe. So you, you worked in Europe for, for some time uh, for CERN. And so what was that experience like? Well, it was fascinating. I, I, was, I left the radio communications area in a way, well, I was no longer doing communications work, but the work I was doing at CERN was... Uh, that of a radio frequency design engineer who was designing equipment operating at radio frequencies which was part of a particle accelerator. Uh, signal generators and power amplifiers. Uh, a particle accelerator consists of a basically a stainless steel pipe which can either be straight or a circle uh, containing a beam of high energy particles which is aimed or focused by a combination of high power magnets, electromagnets, and radio signals applied to electrodes or plates inside this pipe. The pipe is evacuated to a very high vacuum. So what I was doing was designing some of the radio equipment for manipulating these beams. And uh, wow. it fell within my area of experience because the frequency at which we were operating was 9.5 megahertz, which was in the HF or high frequency range. Uh, the work I was doing enabled me to get my master's degree. I was rather pleased about that. Yes. I was able to submit a thesis to the University of Cape Town based on the work I was doing at CERN. So the whole thing, although it was only a three-year appointment, it was well worthwhile for me professionally. Yes, and my goodness, just uh, being able to use radio at, and its applications uh, to nuclear physics... I, I did not know that, that radio was involved there in the, the particle accelerator as well. Well, in fact, the LHC is one of the largest users of high-power radio tubes. The big tubes used in transmitters, some of which are, well, to give you an idea, one of these large tubes can be as big as um, a household water heater. And uh, so, uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, is one of the largest users of these tubes because all the uh, electrodes which move the beams around inside the huge tunnel, the huge uh, vacuum evacuated uh, stainless steel pipe of LHC, are in fact driven by high-power uh, 
radio frequency systems. Huh. That's so interesting. I certainly ne learned something new here. I, it was, oh, I suppose a year ago when we were hearing so much in the news about the Higgs boson and how all of that was coming out of uh, CERN over there. So, goodness, interesting to know how it, a little bit more about how it all comes together. Well, the, the, the thing I've always admired about, although I don't know too much about the theory involved, the thing I've always admired about the high-energy particle physicists is that they are, in a very real sense, on the forefront of human knowledge. And they're very, very much aware of their role in this area, and uh, they're very enthusiastic people. Oh, <clears throat> it must have been so fascinating to have those three years there uh, with everyone that's really on the the edge of human knowledge. Right oh yeah, now. working with working with those guys was fascinating. Wow, incredible! Gosh, and so from from CERN and from uh, Europe, you you came to. Canada? Not directly, no. I went back into the telecom industry. Uh, uh, after my fi I finished up at CERN, uh, I was hired by a U.S. company which was involved in another fascinating field that was quite new at the time, namely uh, commercial satellite communications. And this company uh, was building the earth stations or ground stations, typically equipped with a 26 or 30 meter dish antenna. I'm sure you've seen many pictures of those or possibly even seen one. There used to be, there, there used to be one on the east coast of Canada, um, Mill Village, Nova Scotia. I think it may oh. still be in service. But uh, the, the general idea was that uh, satellites carrying radio transmitters and receivers would be launched into synchronous orbit. That is precisely 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. At that orbit, an object placed in space will revolve around the Earth at the same speed as the Earth revolves on its axis. Therefore, the satellite will be on station, as they call it, will be occupying approximately the same spot at all times. The satellite does move slightly, so the antennas have to track the satellite over a small amount of a small degree of motion, but uh, the satellite stays on station as long as it's uh, in orbit. Eventually, the orbit will decay and the satellite will uh, fall back to Earth and burn up, but it can have a life of many years before that happens. So, I, was, uh, work, I worked for this company installing and testing several of these Earth stations. The Earth station contains microwave transmitters and receivers and other equipment to process the signals coming from the local telecommunications network, the telephone and uh, data network and the internet, uh, send it up to the satellite, bring it back down from the satellite, break it down into individual channels which are then passed into the local network. Uh, satellite communications made possible transcontinent, well, transoceanic telephone calls at a reasonable price. Uh, I recall when I was a child in South Africa, I made a phone call to my parents in London it cost five pounds a minute, maximum duration three minutes. It went by high frequency radio, and it normally took 24 hours to book the call through a series of operators. But with uh, satellite. What a production. Oh, yeah. what a production that was. But then with satellite communications, uh, transoceanic direct dialing became a reality. So you could just pick up the phone and dial a country code, and you'd um, call another country. Uh, it, it wasn't dirt cheap. Um, you still paid a dollar a minute or so. But then with the advent of fiber optic submarine cables, the, cost, the bottom fell out of the cost. So now you can call anywhere in Europe for five cents a minute from North America. It really is incredible when you think <clears> about <throat> it in, in the sense of over the years going from five pounds a minute and having to coordinate all of the operators through how many countries. Wow. What a, and that you were part of setting up that that network. Yes, I felt Bring people closer together. <clears throat> it was exciting because, again, it was something that was on the forefront. Right. And from satellite communications, I branched out into a different discipline within the overall telecommunications sphere because of the close linkages between radio or radio frequency and uh, wire based or uh, land based communications. I found myself migrating into uh, land-based transmission, in other words, the systems and equipment used to uh, 
uh, send large numbers of phone calls across the country, which are called carrier systems. Uh, from there, I found I moved over. I moved into switching, which was uh, the technology that makes telephone exchanges work. And I spent the rest of my career in that area, still though being in touch with radio by way of uh, amateur radio as a hobby. Yes, and and on amateur radio, um, I wanted to ask you about what what sort of radio you you produce with that. Well, amateur radio has so many different facets that it's hard to define any one function or any one activity within amateur radio. There are amateur, there are radio amateurs who make a specialization out of talking to people in distant countries or competing to uh, reach stations in countries where there are not many amateurs. This is known as DX chasing, DX meaning distance. And it's a kind of a competitive activity. They'll have many, many stations in North America yelling and screaming on the air, so to speak, although they'll deny that they yell and scream, <laughs> to uh, reach that one little station on Pitcairn Island or something like that. And the guy in Pitcairn Island is sitting there patiently waiting for somebody to break, break through the mess, otherwise known as the pile-up, uh, to, to, to contact one, one, one station. And this guy who may, uh, the guy is sitting in his, uh, at his station in... Uh, uh, in, in Vancouver or in Edmonton or in Toronto or in Chicago or New York feels absolutely privileged to have been able to work Pitcairn Island. Meanwhile, the guy in Pitcairn Island is uh, wishing he could take a coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's that aspect. Another, wow. another aspect is what is popularly known as rag chewing, where you have a number of guys sitting in their stations and they get on a particular frequency very often there somewhat local to each other, a few hundred kilometers apart, and they just sit and chat about all sorts of stuff. It's that, I tend to enjoy that type of activity because it's relaxed. And uh, there are others who, do, who uh, use amateur radio to do uh, equipment design, research and development. I'm doing a little bit of that. I'm working on uh, uh, the application of an old test method that was used in the telecom industry to a new application for testing the performance of radio receivers. And I'm, I'm in, I've, I've had a couple of articles on this published here and there. I have had them published or I'm getting them published. Oh my goodness. It, very interesting how many different things that you can do depending on your area of interest in amateur radio. Yes. It, it does sound fun though, just uh, being able to, to chat with fellows uh, far away on their, far away their on sets. The, or, Yes, I mean, it's, it's, what, it's what I call the magic of radio. Uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, the, I think boys, it's truthful to say that boys more than girls were fascinated by radio. It just seemed to be a boy thing, a guy thing, if you like. There's I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no intent of uh, any kind of uh, differentiation there, but boys seem to be more interested in the nuts and bolts of things. Uh, although quite a number of women in South Africa were very keen amateur radio operators. Usually um, they went along with their husbands initially and then they discovered that they themselves had an interest in it and were good at it. One of my friends in Johannesburg was uh, the chief radio and radar engineer of the airport and his, he was an avid ham and so was his wife. And uh, she, was also, she, she also had some pretty sound technical knowledge which she'd acquired through interest not through formal training. But uh, there are other, there's another aspect to amateur radio, which is as an adjunct to emergency and public service communications. Uh, the, uh, within every radio club, there's a group that uh, provides local communications at events such as the Sun Run, certainly within our club, the club I belong to, which is the North Shore Amateur Radio Club that meets in North Vancouver. We have a public service and emergency communications group which provides short-range communications at events such as the Sun Run using VHF portable and mobile radios, handheld and, uh, radio and vehicular radios, working through a relay station or repeater mounted on top of a building. The repeater is a transmitter and receiver uh, with uh, filters in a box connected to an antenna, and its purpose is to take a signal on one frequency and retransmit it on another from a high point. So if you're down in the street with a little walkie-talkie, a little handheld, you can communicate up to, with another handheld up to 60 kilometers away, uh, effectively right up to the horizon, using a repeater if the repeater is high enough. Typically the repeater can be 
anything from 30 to 100 meters above the ground. My goodness. And so uh, a special event like the Sun Run, like you mentioned, but uh, I would imagine in emergency situations as well. Uh, we all seem to rely so heavily now on um, all of the technology we use every day, but you know, in the event of, of an earthquake or some such um, the occurrence, um, would that be a, a time when your club would also be setting up uh, radio communication? Oh, absolutely. I can give you an example I can remember from a few years ago when there was that landslide up uh, by Riverside Drive. Of course, yes. It breached uh, several telephone cables, so the people in the neighborhood, in the affected neighborhood, were without phone service. So our club has um, an emergency communications van fitted out with various radios and a, uh, and a generator. They drove the van up to the top of the... I think they drove it right up Mount Seymour as far as they could go and set up emergency communications from that van, and uh, they sent people with radios into the affected areas, and if anybody needed to make a 911 call, for example, uh, one of the amateur radio operators would relay the call to a point where there was a working phone, and the call could be made that way. Wow, so very, very the, useful. Uh, amateur radio has, has saved and is saving lives. In fact, it's so imp the uh, emergency communications role of amateur radio it's so important that uh, a few years ago, I think in 2007, at their uh, quadrennial World Radio Conference, the ITU, which I mentioned previously, uh, defined a disaster communications role for amateur radio, which places amateur radio on an incomparably higher level in the eyes of governments all over the world. Excellent that they recognize such the, the very important role that well, the amateur radio uh, community has in such situations. Yes. In fact, I would say that uh, in the United States, uh, FEMA and uh, the Department of Homeland Security are not only taking an active interest in working with amateur radio organizations, they actually have been funding them to acquire equipment to, to improve their emergency readiness. And in things like the disaster, tornado disasters that have t torn up the Midwest and the flood disasters, you know, the recent floods in Alberta and this uh, train disaster in Quebec. Hams were right there providing communications. Oh, wow. The, the unsung heroes, I'd say, of, of such disasters. Really. Oh, abso absolutely. Absolutely. And every, every radio amateur is willing to participate in this type of activity. Excellent. Yes. And so I wish we could keep speaking. It's such, a, such an interesting experience you've had in, in so many different aspects of radio, but is there, is there any one moment in your career, uh, professional or amateur, that is particularly memorable for you? Well, there probably are several. The, the day I got my uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering was a very, very big moment for me. And the day I got my first amateur license is something I'll never forget. I got a phone call from the local post office. Uh, this was in the suburb of Cape Town, informing me that my amateur radio license was ready to be picked up. So I walked down to the post office, and there was the license. And the postal clerk said, by the way, do you have a, a radio receiving license? Those were required in South Africa in those days. And I looked at him, and I didn't say anything. And he said, aha, you're a... Uh, Use the German word Schwarzhörer means a black listener, somebody who's a pirate listener, if you like. So I said, yes, uh, I am a Schwarzhörer. Well, you better stop being one if you want your amateur license. That'll be 10 shillings for the amateur license and 35 shillings for your wireless receiving license, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked away with a big grin and the two licenses in my hand and went straight home and got on the air. And oh, wow. uh, he, didn't, he didn't prosecute me for not having a wireless receiving license, which was nice. <laughs> oh, that helps. <laughs> that helps it be a good memory. <laughs> and there have been other, other moments as well. Um, at, uh, certainly when I started working at Raycal, and uh, I went into the HR office, and the first piece of paper I had to sign was the Official Secrets Act. That was something to think about. Ooh. Wow. Well, for quite a few years, I wasn't able to talk about some of the work I was doing. But of course, that's all gone now. It expired. But uh, it was that. And then oh, top secret. That, that does have 
I remember, <laughs> I remember going to radio club meetings and people were asking me, what is it exactly you're working on? And I just smile like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> and uh, I said, some, ma- some matters are best left undiscussed and undebated. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Later on, of course, uh, it was possible to talk about this stuff more freely. Yes. And then uh, when I was notified, uh, more recently, when the, uh, when the Radio Society of Great Britain, RSGB, notified me that they'd accepted an article on the, this new receiver test method that I'd uh, been working on uh, for publication in their magazine, Radcom. I was just thrilled to bits. I was in England at the time, and I spoke to the editor on the phone. Oh, my And goodness. it's going to be published in a few other places as well now. I'm quite pleased about that. Fantastic. Wow. So many good memories through the years and right up to present day. Yes, and one thing I will, I do want to emphasize... Uh, amateur radio has also made me a number of lifelong friends with whom I'm still in touch. And when I mean lifelong, one of my friends is uh, uh, a man who is five years younger than I am. He lives in England now. We've known each other since 1964. I remember vividly that he came to my house because he wanted to see a, a single sideband high-frequency transceiver, an, an amateur radio transceiver which I designed and built. Um, he was 19, I was 24 at the time, and I let him operate the thing, and he was just uh, <laughs> absolutely uh, on cloud nine. Anyway, we've kept in touch with a gap of some decades. We, re- we sort of rediscovered each other via the web, but we've, we've kept in touch ever since. So th- this is a, another thing about amateur radio. The friends you make at the beginning, very often you'll stay in touch with for the rest of your life. How wonderful. Such a nice thought to, to end our interview. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for joining us on Radio BVM. This has been a fascinating discussion. And for our listeners, that was Adam Farson, radio expert, and Camille signing off from Radio BVM. <laughs>